Thank you. Uh, yeah, very quickly, just a little bit about me and my background. Uh, I did my graduate work in economics, so I'm trained as an applied econometrician. Uh, I created the stats models package in Python. Um, I spent a lot of time working on that instead of my graduate school. Uh, and so here I am now at a Pi Data conference instead of somewhere else. Uh, I now work at Civis Analytics. Uh, I run our R&D department and I am a product lead. Civis is a data science services and technology company. We help businesses make better decisions with um, data science and technology. Uh, we started out of the Obama campaign in, in 2013 uh, and have been chugging along since then uh, based out of Chicago. Uh, yeah, so the idea for this talk uh, had been rattling around in my head for about a year or so, um, but the genesis for actually sitting down and writing the talk was this tweet, so credit where credit is due. Uh, this is Cam Davidson uh, Pilon. He's the director of data at Shopify, uh, wrote a book, Bayesian Methods for Hackers, uh, and he has this uh, quote. He said, I'm predicting a, an econometric sub-revolution in data science, followed by a credibility crisis, followed by a retreat to experimental design. Um, which I agree with the premise of, not necessarily the conclusion, um, but I, it, it helped kind of solidify what I wanted to talk about today. And we're going to focus a little bit about uh, what does it mean to have an econometric sub-revolution? Like, what does this even mean? Um, why is there a credibility crisis? I, I'll argue that there is. It's not just kind of looming and coming, but we have one and we live in one. Um, and then, you know, what should we learn? What should we take away? And what should we do about it? Uh, focusing on kind of the, the science of uh, data science. Uh, so just to set the scene a little bit, we're going to go through four decades of econometric history, um, and we're going to do it in about two minutes. Uh, so in 1983, Ed Lemer wrote this kind of manifesto uh, called Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics. Um, back then, you know, empirical economics didn't have an impact on policymaking. Uh, decision makers didn't really take it seriously. A lot of the studies were you know, based on 20 to 25 data points, uh, and it was all kind of theory driven. Whoever was kind of the loudest had the say on uh, what policy decisions were made. Um, but fast forward about three or four decades in 2010, um, two applied econometricians, Angrist and Pischke, wrote this um, paper called The Credibility Revolution in Empirical Economics, uh, How Better Research Design is Taking the Con Out of Econometrics. Uh, so what does that mean? Um, they argued basically that you know, because of the strides that the, the, had been taken in the field, that now uh, econometrics and economics mattered. People listened to what uh, economists had to say in making policy decisions. Um, so why was there a problem before? Uh, the, at the time of Lemur, a lot of the, the arguments that were taking place in their literature, you know, the paper rejoinder, 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 were arguing about whether or not they logged a variable uh, or what the functional form of the, the uh, equation was that they were trying to estimate. Um, so it's no wonder that no one wasn't really paying attention or thinking that the, the conclusions they were coming to were valid. Um, so what happened in the interim? One, more and better data. Uh, so this is kind of a no-brainer. Um, there's fewer distractions, uh, and this was led by better econometric theory, so people stopped talking about <coughs> functional form. Uh, they realized that, you know, with some study and some better understanding of what we were actually doing, it didn't actually, if you were careful, it didn't really actually matter if you logged a variable or not, or if you picked the wrong functional form under certain conditions, you could still make valid conclusions from data. Um, and then there's just better research design overall. Um, this is the crux of their argument, and this is what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and what did better research design mean? It meant, one, the rise of quasi-experimental designs. So, you know, we kind of know that the randomized control trial is the, the gold standard for making decisions or conclusions uh, using the scientific method. It's really hard to do in economics, uh, and as we'll see also in businesses. Um, so methods to help people do what we call quasi-experimental design, and we'll dig into what that means a little bit. And then some subfields actually started doing randomized control trials, um, and so this was great. Uh, the conclusions people were making were well understood um, and believable. Uh, the the kind of counterclaim, uh, which is, I, I would argue, a good problem to have, uh, is basically, okay, we now know that, you know, you're doing these studies and what you're saying is true, but does it generalize? Um, which, is, which is a good problem to have, a good question to be asking. Uh, so the outcome was basically that uh, ec economists now had relevance in policy, policy decisions. People listened to them. Uh, that's great. 
and why. Um, so this is the, a subtle but key part of their argument. It's this focus on research design and good design lends itself to basically better communication. Um, so good, good designs uh, are simple um, and uh, they lead to a straightforward presentation of results and we'll see exactly uh, what this means. And this has kind of become a theme in a lot of the talks that I've been given recently, like one of the biggest problems in all of data science is how people don't know how to talk to each other. Um, so if there's one kind of takeaway that you take from this talk, it's that simple, effective communication can take you further in, in your career and have, make you have a larger impact than just about anything else. Uh, so, okay, I've, I've hinted at it a little bit, but what does this actually have to do with, with data science? So first, I heard some people talking beforehand about what is actually data science. I'm just going to put up a definition and say it's true. Uh, it, it will be true for this talk. Um, so this is a little bit some of the evolution of uh, some terminology that people have used uh, or some method, definitions that people have used to talk about data science. Um, I will just say a data scientist uses multidisciplinary methods to understand and have a measurable impact on a business process or product. Um, and this measurable impact is actually really, really key. Um, so it doesn't mean you, you go out and do a bunch of cool stuff and it, it never matters. Uh, it's actually following through and having the impact that's one of the most important parts. Um, and so how do they do this? Ideally, um, but rarely, uh, they follow basically the scientific method. Um, so this is not uh, anything terribly new probably to most people in this room. Uh, it looks a little bit different within an organization, but the, the first step is you come up with the question. Uh, is the product or business question either comes from you or comes from the business. So a couple of examples, how do our marketing campaigns perform? Uh, what's driving employee attrition? So these are just questions. Next, we come up with a hypothesis. Uh, it necessarily has to be falsifiable, so it has to be something that we can say is true or we're not sure or uh, is false or we're not sure. Um, so for example, the return on investment for our marketing campaigns is greater than break even. So it either is or it isn't. Um, so we now have something that we want to measure. And now uh, comes the, the kind of interesting part in what we're going to talk about today is research design. Uh, you need to sit down and design a strategy that allows you to test uh, this hypothesis and takes into account you know, the threats to validity. So how can my approach fail, basically? And then the analysis step is a whole lot of trying to see if you're wrong, <laughs> uh, trying to it, like, test your threats to validity. And then finally, uh, you need to communicate the results in a way that people understand, whether that's business stakeholders, whether it's the engineering team, uh, anyone in your organization. If you don't do the last final step, um, then it doesn't matter. Uh, so we work a lot with you know, large organizations across the country, like Fortune 50 companies, uh, and we've had you know, executives at these large organizations sit down with our CEO and say, I have a team of 150 data scientists, I have no idea what they do. Uh, they have no measurable impact on how I make decisions. Um, that is bad. <laughs> uh, and what we're going to do is talk about some methods that I hope can push us towards having uh, uh, more credibility. Um, so where does this credibility crisis come from? Which, which parts of these steps are, are we failing at? I, I'd argue it's these three. Um, so the question is basically everyone's responsibility. Um, but they're often unclear um, and success is left undefined. Um, so some of you may have worked on teams or have friends that work on teams uh, that are very much an example of this. Uh, they go to work and they're unclear of what they need to be doing. The business stakeholders are unclear about uh, what they can be doing, what they should even expect from them. Um, and it leads to, to kind of chaos and no impact. Um, a focus on research design. So a lot of data science in the last decade, five to 10 years, has been focused on uh, black box predictive models. So this isn't totally fair, and I'll talk about why it's not, but a lot of the, the uh, hotness is I go into a computer science program and I focus on machine learning. I focus on deep learning, um, which is great, and there are, like, are valid use cases for that, but it's, it's not everything, especially if you need to then turn around and, and have an impact and have credibility. Um, these threats to validity of understanding what we're trying to measure are just brushed aside or, or not even thought about because they're people are not necessarily all trained in, in how to think like this. Uh, and then finally is, is this communication theme back again. Um, people don't know how to talk to each other uh, or don't necessarily even understand the value of what's been done. Um, so, okay, uh, am I saying that data scientists is just about running experiments? Uh, kind of, it kind of is. Uh, so back to good design, simple explanation. Um, this, it doesn't get simpler than this uh, in terms of uh, kind of the, the scientific method. Uh, randomized control trial is the gold standard uh, of what we're trying to do. 
So we have a population that we want to understand, and then we have a, a treatment effect that we want to measure. Say, in this case, it's, you know, we want to have a job training program that we think will increase productivity of our workers. Uh, we're a company that has offices, warehouses, distribution centers, and we want to better train our workers so that they're more productive. So we randomly assign all of the workers to a job training program. Uh, the only difference between them then is that they either got the program or they didn't. Uh, and then we measure, was productivity higher? And here we see the treated group and the control group. Uh, we may start to think, okay, yeah, it looks like this uh, job productivity or job training program led to higher productivity in this case. Um, again, because the only difference between these two groups because of random assignment um, is the job training. Unfortunately, never really works like this in, in the real world, uh, especially within organizations. Um, it's a hard sell. Uh, and here's a few reasons of uh, why it's a hard sell. These are all as, as close to quotes as my memory will allow of actual discussions that we've had with organizations. Um, so say one of the things you want to do is uh, have better sales, have a better targeting program for your salespeople. Reach out to people they know they're going to be able to have an impact with. Um, well, you uh, pitch this to the VP of sales, and the VP of sales says, well, you got a program to make people better at selling. Everybody's getting that. Uh, we're not going to not give that to some people just so we can see whether or not it has an effect. And it's okay. Uh, so I think the, the quote was like, that's taking food out of my mouth. I'm not going to opt into the B group. Mm -mm. Um, so if you want to measure digital ad effectiveness, uh, running a control ad is too ex expensive. So you go to a CMO, and you tell her, okay, your marketing budget is you know, $80 million. I just need a million of that to run a control ad, which is going to be a public service announcement, so that we can see if your real ad had an effect. And she looks at you like you're crazy. There's no way I'm spending a million dollars to buy a PSA. Uh, that's not what we're in the business of. If we have an ad, we're going to run it. Okay, uh, well, I hope it works. Uh, and then if you want to do some interventions for customer retention, um, so it's, it's kind of the results will be difficult to interpret. We're never actually going to know whether the campaign or what we're trying to undertake uh, had an effect, so let's just not try. Uh, okay. Um, so, and even if we could run an experiment, uh, things can go wrong with experiments. Um, so you may have insufficient randomization. So in the job training example, you may have randomized at the county level, and what you end up measuring is actually like the education in certain counties. Like maybe people that come out of certain counties are just better trained. So your uh, experimental design is invalid. You did not measure a job training program. Uh, spillover effects. You do the job training program. Some people see it. They're leaders in organizations. And some people are not getting the job training. They think it's great. So they post all the materials. And some people go out and try to do it themselves. Your experiment is now invalid. Uh, you can't measure the effects to the job training program. And then partial compliance and attrition, the, the more human factors. Um, so some people may show up to the job training, but they don't pay attention. They just sleep in the back. Uh, or attrition. Uh, they only took sign up at the first one. So they assumed everybody went through the whole training program, and they didn't. Um, so these are all threats, uh, threats to uh, the validity of a randomized control trial. Um, so all is not lost, but this is actually where the social science comes in handy. Um, so I think the, the science behind data scientists Data science looks a lot more like um, the social sciences than uh, we may have acknowledged in the past. Uh, and I'm not just trying to justify going to grad school, and I'm pretty sure that's true. Um, <laughs> but we'll see. You tell me. Uh, so we didn't run an experiment. We had a job training program, and we let people self-select into it. Um, and we know we didn't run a randomized control trial, but hey, that's why we learned regression in undergrad, right? Uh, we just need to run a regression and everything's fine. Uh, so D here is whether or not you are in the job training program, and then X is everything else you know about each individual. Um, so you weren't randomly assigned to that job training program, but if we control for everything, uh, then what we're left with is the, the partial correlation of the job training program on Y productivity. Uh, great. Let's just do that. Uh, so. What can go wrong if we do that? So these are just a few threats to uh, validity in a regression approach. Uh, the first is omitted variable bias. Um, so did we omit variables that could plausibly explain uh, the outcome of interest? So people may actually be going out and doing training on their own. They may be going to night school. Uh, and you didn't measure that. You didn't know that. Uh, and so the thing that you're capturing is actually the fact that these people are getting training somewhere else. Um, so your, 
your experiment is invalid. Uh, endogeneity bias. So this is kind of uh, the what's the direction of causation. So m maybe you're a consultant or maybe you work in kind of a center of excellence model doing data science for an organization. They come to you and they're like, hey, we want to do this ex post and measure uh, whether or not uh, this job training program had an effect. The problem is the person whose project this was isn't there anymore. And what they did was actually target all of the low productivity facilities for this job training in the first place. But everybody forgot that. It's like lost uh, to institutional knowledge. Um, your experiment is invalid. Uh, finally, there's sample selection bias. So maybe you actually did ask people to sign up uh, and only the people that opted in did the job training and those people were like just go-getters. Um, so they're different. Uh, and so you're not actually measuring the effect of the job training. You're, you're figuring out that your go-getters are more productive. Um, so all of these bias this coefficient D. So you measure it, you estimate it, it's wrong. Uh, so what can we do to avoid some of these threats to validity? Um, just some research design strategies from the social sciences, because this is the bread and butter of, of economics, uh, of political science. It's really hard to run experiments um, in, in, in industry as well as in these academic settings. Uh, so we've spent you know, the better part of a century developing maybe more uh, developing methods to try to take care of these things. So the first method is probably the most esoteric. Uh, it's called instrumental variable regression. Um, this is popularized by Stephen Levitt in the book Freakonomics. Uh, so if you've ever heard of that or, or read that, um, most of the, the design, research design strategies in that book are instrumental variables, which I also call just like clever econometrics. Um, so what is it? Well, first of all, I can get around problems like reverse causation. Um, so maybe you, you want to test the effect of a blood pressure medication, and so you in enroll people in a study, and then you say, don't change anything about your life. Here's this blood pressure med medication, and then you have a placebo and the, the actual pill, but then they start thinking a lot about blood pressure, and they also start going to a gym and they get a personal trainer. You're no longer a a measuring the effect of just that medication. Uh, the other is common unobserved confounders. Um, so this is something like uh, late, a latent variable like ability uh, determines whether or not you're more productive and whether you go to the job training. So it's actually you know, whether or not you're a go-getter that matters, but what you have is a, now a spurious correlation between uh, the job training and productivity. Um, but you, because you didn't measure the like, you're just a go-getter. Um, so what we do is we find variables called instruments uh, that are correlated with X, um, but not caused by Y, and that affect Y, but only through X. I'll explain what this means. Um, so this is a kind of a now classic example from the uh, ec economics literature and econometrics, uh, the Fulton Fish Market paper. So I think the idea of this paper was they wanted to understand uh, how um, demand changes if they ch like put in a po tax policy for the price of fish at the Fulton Fish Market in New York. Um, so they wanted to basically estimate the demand curve. Uh, okay, great. So they went to the fish market, collected a bunch of data for a bunch of different days, um, and then they regret, regress quantity on price. It's downward sloping. Uh, that's a demand curve. Uh, wrong. So if you remember Econ 101, each one of these data points is an intersection of a supply curve and a demand curve. So we actually don't know whether the price has changed here because of, uh, or the quantities here changed because of uh, either supply effects or demand effects. Uh, so the researcher who worked on this paper, she thought of a clever instrument, and that instrument was weather. Uh, so the weather off the, in particular, the weather off the coast uh, in New York. So if the weather was really bad, not that many fishermen went out to catch fish that day, so it artificially restricted the quantity. But the weather was really nice in Manhattan, so everybody was still going to the fish market and buying their fish uh, for their restaurants or whatever. Uh, so what they did was estimate, uh, they estimated effects that were just due to changes in supply. Uh, and so weather here is the instrument, and now you've isolated the demand effects, and now you can isolate the demand curve, or estimate the demand curve. Um, another common technique is, uh, this is a whole series of techniques, actually there's a whole literature behind this, um, called matching. Uh, so matching basically creates a pseudo control group and uh, based on your treatment group. So you ran a, a randomized experiment, or you ran an experiment, but it wasn't randomized. 
What you need to do is find a bunch of people that were not exposed to your treatment, but look a, a heck of a lot like, almost exactly like uh, the people who were exposed. And in that case, what you've done is created a pseudo control group, and now you can plausibly estimate uh, the effect of your treatment. So this looks a lot like a randomized control trial. Uh, the trick is here estimating this group such that comparing these two groups is valid, basically. Um, and then you just match and measure the difference, um, and now you have uh, uh, average treatment effect. Another technique um, is called difference in differences. So you can use difference in differences if you have two or more groups and you measure them over time, and in between the two measurement groups, there's an intervention or a treatment. So the example here is, you know, maybe you're doing a cohort analysis. Um, so you have two groups of customers. You have your loyal old customers um, uh, that are here, kind of the yellow line, uh, and then you have new customers. So both are trending up over time um, because everybody loves your stuff. It's great, and they're buying a lot of it. Um, but in the interim, you ran an email campaign, and you just reached out to your loyal customers. Uh, you reached out to the people who had purchased from you more than 10 times, say. Uh, so they started at a higher baseline. Now, if you were naive and tried to measure the effect of this, uh, then you may think the effect of your loyalty campaign is this whole difference, um, but it's not. It's actually just the difference in differences, right? So it's the smaller uh, but n now validly measured effect. So you see that a lot in uh, time series experiments. Uh, next, regression discontinuity. Um, so if there is a technical, natural, or randomly occurring cutoff that deci decides whether or not you are assigned to treatment, then you can use this, uh, what we call a regression discontinuity, uh, to measure the effect uh, of a treatment. So the, the crux here is that um, the observations that are on either side of that treatment line, uh, for all intents and purposes, look almost exactly alike. Uh, so you may use this a lot in like uh, targeted display advertising. People who didn't get an ad or did get an ad uh, and a machine is making that decision, um, that's what we call like a technical cutoff and you can, you, you can exploit that to try to measure the effect of your uh, campaign. Um, so in this case, let's think about our job training example again. So say HR rolls out the job training policy and that's great, but they decided that every class that's under 20 uh, is now breakout sessions. So it's taught differently. Um, it's more interactive. Uh, so what you can do is, uh, the colors don't show up here that well, but you can take the groups really close to 20 and uh, on both sides and think these are your treated groups. So this is like, treat, does the lecture format, is it more effective than the small group discussion format? Uh, and you kind of throw away everybody else because you know, they're probably different. Uh, the idea being that the size of those two companies means that they're probably alike in most of the characteristics that you care about. Um, so on this, I think, is the last kind of technique that I'll talk about today. I could go on for a very long time, but it's survey experiments. Um, so survey experiments are increasingly used uh, everywhere, especially in political science. Uh, somewhere between a true experiment and a quasi-experiment, you basically give a survey instrument to a bunch of randomly selected people, and you can test a whole host of uh, hypotheses that you care about. Uh, we'll look at a really cool example of this in a little bit. Um, what are some of the different kinds of uh, survey experiments? So this is just uh, randomly picked three. Um, so that you can have scenario-based surveys uh, where you want to test aspects of a hypothetical scenario. So if you work on a product team with a product manager and the product manager has five things that they care about and there's 15 different attributes they can change in each one of those five things, uh, it's really hard to know what to do. Um, so one of the ways you could do this is design a survey experiment, which basically involves asking some people some of the questions and then try to figure out the best thing overall to do. Um, so that's a cool, a cool technique. Uh, priming and framing survey experiments. Uh, you could use this to test creative uh, or, I don't know, a, like a political ad uh, and see if it has an effect on people uh, and whether or not they then would show up to vote or change, persuades them one way or another on your candidate. Uh, so this is like super heavily used in politics. Um, and another maybe like a list-based experiment where you have uh, some kind of sensitive thing that you either have or don't have in a, in a, a list of things and then you ask someone a question. Um, you could use this for if you work on like a crisis team in marketing and there's been some horrible event and you've spilled oil all over the Gulf and did anyone notice. 
uh, those kind of things, you know, or, or they noticed, but uh, did it actually have an effect on them buying my product? So you may want to use, that's a terrible example. Uh, <laughs> but you may want to use a list-based uh, list survey experiment to, to try to understand that. You should probably find a new job, though. Uh, so the, the crux is this attention to research design focuses the discussion. So you now know what to talk about, uh, which is really nice. It's actually the like, you know, liberating constraints idea. Uh, you don't have to talk about the functional form of the, the S demand anymore. It's, uh, we know very clearly why these things go wrong because we know how we, you know, our strategy that we use to estimate things. Uh, so for instrumental variables, we have two restrictions, an exclusion restriction and a relevance restriction. So relevance uh, is our instrument correlated with the endogenous variable. Uh, okay, weather is correlated with uh, price, we know that. Um, but is it an exclusion restriction? Can it only affect the price uh, through uh, demand or supply in this case? Well, yeah, weather does not, off the coast, does not affect whether or not someone shows up to the farmer's market or the Fulton fish market. Uh, so that's great. Uh, if you go to econ grad school, this is basically what you do for about 150 hours is sit in a room and argue about whether the uh, exclusion restriction is met. Uh, so one we can test with stats, the other we can't. Uh, just brain power. Uh, this is why, that's why I call it like the clever econometrics tricks. Uh, matching, uh, the crux of whether or not matching is valid is basically like, do, do you observe everything that makes your pseudo control group and your treatment group the same uh, or different? Um, and if you do, great. You probably created a, a two separate groups that are alike in everything but treatment. If not, you may have an invalid result and we'll see a result of, that shows that in a second. Uh, and regret, regression discontinuity, the human factor comes in. Uh, so with regression discontinuities, a lot of times people know the mechanism by which something changes, so they try to game the system. Uh, so if it's 20, you know, they'll hire a new person. We're now 21, and we uh, have a different program. Uh, so that can make those results invalid. But these are the things that we talk about. This is, these are the threats to validity that we have to check. Um, yeah, where's all the super awesome machine learning stuff that I was told I get to do as a data scientist? Uh, so it's still there. Uh, this is kind of just the basics, and this has been kind of uh, an area of research and kind of an explosion, actually. Uh, I don't know if I just started paying attention to it uh, post-grad school more, or if it really, things really have started to change since 2008, 2010. I think it's the latter, based on the publication date of a lot of these papers. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, um, but just to give you a flavor, so post-selection inference. Um, so scikit-learn says I just run the lasso, and it gets rid of the variables that don't matter. Uh, and then I can just run a regression again, and then I do a t-test, and we're done, right? Nope. Uh, as soon as you ran the lasso, all statistical theory went out the door. Um, and a lot of the work in the post-selection inference group is, is trying to figure out what that statistical theory actually is. Uh, and there's been some really cool results there. Uh, and then earlier I said, uh, you know, jokingly, that a lot of these are, are just black box models, and it doesn't really matter, and nobody cares. Uh, that's not entirely true or fair. There's been a whole lot of uh, research into making those things more interpretable. So if I put a record into a, basically a black box model, why does it then give me the result? What part of that record makes, makes that model give me the result that uh, I'm getting? Uh, and then double machine learning, it's pretty cool because it does machine learning twice. Uh, no, that's actually my favorite. It's like really accessible and, and uh, easy to use. Uh, and kind of combines a lot of the best of like ensemble methods with uh, the kind of social science techniques that uh, we're all, well, I'm used to. These are uh, a couple of econometricians at I think MIT and, and University of Chicago. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna go through just a few case studies to like prove to you that people are actually doing this stuff uh, and have actually been doing it for about 40 years once we get to the, the third. Um, so, Shout out here is just to, to start or join a journal club at your work. Uh, Steven sitting over here runs our journal club uh, at work. Uh, is a great way to share ideas and continue to stay on top of uh, the literature and, and keep the team motivated and learning new things. Uh, it takes about two or three hours a week uh, and it's better than what you could be doing in that time probably. And if anybody asks, tell them I said that. Uh, so the first paper uh, I'll call kind of a, a retreat to experiments. Um, so this is uh, called Here, There, and Everywhere Correlated Online Behaviors Can Lead to Overestimates of the Effects of Advertising. Um, so this is kind of a cautionary tale about using quasi-experimental uh, methods 
uh, in place of an experiment. And this is by Lewis and Rao. They were researchers at Yahoo. Um, so they have written a lot of really good papers. Uh, so they found that observational experiment methods or quasi-experimental methods overestimate the causal impact of advertising uh, due to what they call activity bias. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but they had three things they wanted to look at. Uh, this, is, this is at Yahoo. The first one was uh, the effects of uh, an ad on searches. So if you advertise for a certain brand, uh, were people then searching for uh, things of that nature, right? So they, you, the experiment here is they had 250 million impressions on Yahoo, and they had a 5% control group. Um, they observed, a f with the experiment, a 5.4 increase in search traffic via an experiment. So, okay, like, yeah, it looks like things probably had some effect. Uh, and then they tried to replicate that finding through quasi-experimental methods. So just using matching, they saw a 1,200% increase in search traffic. Uh, using a, a regression technique, uh, they found an 800% increase in search traffic. These are implausible. These are why people don't think we're credible. Uh, and then difference in differences, they found about 100% increase in search traffic. So difference in differences here like kind of washed out a lot of the trends, which is interesting. Um, so, I mean, when you show that to someone who has a, a, an intuition about the size, what the size of the effect should be, or if you just like, I don't know, how, much, how, how many of y'all have actually been influenced by an ad online to go do something? Uh, probably not, not most of you. Uh, then you can run into trouble. Um, if you like come with these implausible estimates. I do think, just as a caveat, like these could have been better designed uh, to, to, to get at the effect. Like you, you get the 1200% and then you refine uh, because you know it's implausible. Uh, the second, but we'll come back to their, their argument. Um, the second is the effect of consumption on just Yahoo pages. So I, Yahoo used to be like where you start on the internet. So you like, you know, explore around, you're not just searching, uh, which took me a minute to remember. Uh, <laughs> And then, so they ran a survey experiment uh, using Amazon Mechanical Turk, so just a, a way to find survey uh, takers. They had a treatment and control group, and they wanted to show them an ad and then see whether or not, because they measured the outcome, you know, when they knew who they were targeting, w did their Yahoo search activity change? Um, so they found that it did. You know, they, saw, they showed them the ad, uh, and they were searching more on Yahoo. Uh, they didn't show them the ad, and they found that they were searching more on Yahoo. Uh, so the treatment and control here also had the same effect. So something weird's going on. And then they had a third kind of study that they looked at. Um, these are all their experiments. And they wanted to look at the competitive effects of advertising. So this was really interesting. They got two competitors to agree to participate in an experiment with Yahoo. Uh, so they advertised for the competitor and then they observed whether people signed up or bought something from uh, another competitor. Uh, so that called a major firm and, and competitor firm. Uh, so they had 200 million impressions and a 10% control, and they tracked the signups on the competitor, co and they did find the effect. So they advertised for, uh, you know, Ace, and then they saw the uh, effect in signups at True Value or whatever. Um, they also saw them s more people sign up uh, at the firm who was advertising. So they observed both an effect on the competitor and for the firm that was advertising. They also observed these people just searching on Yahoo more. Uh, so their, like, their like, argument is that when people get on the internet, they're just on the internet. Uh, so your internet behavior is correlated. You just do more stuff on the internet. So if you don't have access to everything about these people that uh, like the advertisers are using to target them, which for the case of you know, Google, Facebook, or whatever, you don't, uh, then you're not going to be able to use quasi-experimental methods to, to tease out the actual true effect. Woof. Uh, so I think this led to a follow-up paper where they want to look at like what are the actual limits to measurement. Um, so they called this paper, the, I think the working title was The Unfavorable Economics of Measuring the Returns to Advertising. Um, so the conclusion of this paper is this is very difficult to measure whether or not ads have an effect, but it's not impossible. Uh, so why is this hard? First, the effect sizes are really, really small. Um, so there, you know, these ad campaigns are somewhere on the order of like $5 million to you know, $600 million. Uh, and then the effect that they're trying to measure is like, did someone go buy scissors at Office Depot or something? Uh, so the effect sizes are really, really small. They're also really noisy. Um, so it may, if instead of buying scissors, it may be like you're buying a desk. So the, the size of that is very large, but you do it very infrequently. 
So the standard deviation uh, to average is super, super high. Uh, so the, the conclusion was you should either design an experiment, it's hard, uh, you can use observational methods, but see our earlier paper, basically. Uh, so just to fix ideas about why this is hard, so if the effect sizes are small, then the null hypothesis and the alternative, you know, ads have an effect, is really close together. And because the standard deviation is large, these also like really, really overlap. So how do you get better estimates? You have to collect a lot of data. Uh, and we call that the power of an experiment. And the power goes up. You're more likely to find out whether, an if an effect exists, that it's there if you have more power. So they went and looked at 25 experiments. Uh, the experiments were across retail sales and financial services. They measured new sales and new account signups. Uh, and they ran these experiments for two to 135 days, uh, cost up to half a million dollars. Um, and they you know, measured anywhere from 100,000 to 10 million impressions. So this is the, this is the size of these uh, studies that people had previously undertaken and they were going back to look at. So what are the things they wanted to look at? The first was, you know, okay, did, was there any positive return on advertising? So I don't care how much it costs, was there any effect? Um, and they found that only 10 out of the 25 studies had enough power to test any effect. Uh, so, okay. Um, they did find that the ones that were powered had a significant and positive effect. So it's not just uh, shouting into the wind. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Okay, but what if you want to get a little more precise? Uh, so let's say that we have a positive return. Uh, and by positive return, we mean like wildly profitable. This actually moves the effect sizes apart and makes it easier to measure. So 50% return. Only three had enough power uh, to even make a conclusion. Um, the median campaign would have had to been 10 times larger. So if you're running a $600,000 campaign, you would have had to spend $6 million uh, to, to even be able to measure whether or not what you're doing has an effect. Now say you want to get more precise and say a 10% return. Uh, if any of us went to business school, like an IRR of 10% usually means, okay, yeah, we should probably undertake this. It's higher than interest rates or whatever. We could just go park our money somewhere. Um, they found every single experiment was underpowered. None of the experiments could have actually measured a 10% return. Um, then the, retail, the average retail campaign, median retail campaign, would have had to be 60 times larger. Uh, and the financial services, they would have had to be 1,200 times larger. Uh, so that's a pretty hefty uh, budget just to measure whether or not what you're doing has an effect, because retail is super competitive and, and low margins. Um, OK, that's kind of stark. Uh, a little more positive, like what are some of the, the things you can do with data science used, wielded like well within an industry? You could change the course of an industry. Uh, so this has become one of my favorite papers. Uh, I recommend it to everyone and revisit it all the time. It's from the 80s uh, and it's about Courtyard by Marriott. Basically Courtyard by Marriott that we all kind of know uh, was designed by a bunch of statist statistician consultants for Marriott uh, in 1983. Uh, so, designing a hotel facility with consumer-based marketing models. Uh, so, basically, Marriott used conjoint analysis, which is the survey experiment that I was uh, describing earlier about how we can test, you know, what's the ideal mix of features for a product uh, to design an entirely new hotel chain. So, they ran a survey uh, where they wanted to test seven different facets. Each of these had 50 attributes with up to eight levels. So things like, should I put the pool in the middle? Should the pool be L-shaped? Do people care about HBO in the rooms? Uh, you can go read the whole uh, survey design in the paper. Um, but they wanted to test all of these, uh, which is an implausible thing for any single person to have an opinion on all of these. So uh, that's why you have to do the survey experiment called the conjoint analysis. Uh, and what were the actual impacts of this? They also went on to simulate, okay, given what we found out via the survey experiment, we're going to forecast the market share that you're going to capture and tell you actually how, many, how much your profit is going to be. Uh, and they captured within 4% of the predicted market share. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. Um, but what was the actual impact? Uh, so they had three test cases in 83, uh, 90 and 87 predicted to be 300 by 94 uh, with an expected $1 billion in sales just from making the changes that were uh, prescribed by this experiment. They created 3,000, eventually 15,000 new jobs. And every single other person who was in the, the kind of hospitality industry had to change what they were doing. Uh, they had to make an offering that looked like Courtyard by Marriott because it became just kind of what 
uh, everyone expected. Um, so that's pretty cool. Just a little stats. Data science. Uh, <laughs> so I gotta stay on, on t topic. Uh, so wrapping up, uh, shout out to Judea Pearl, who's keynoting later today. Uh, he's made a career uh, talking about uh, causal inference and how we should be thinking about it. Uh, he has, may talk about some very similar things uh, to what I just talked about, but using completely different language. Uh, and it should be super, super entertaining. Um, so in conclusion, I think this, the credibility crisis that I've talked about a little bit is preventable. Um, focus on business relevant and measurable outcomes from the start and know what success looks like. Uh, I can't tell you how often this is uh, overlooked by people. It seems obvious, but uh, it's actually quite difficult. Um, be clear about the causal mechanisms uh, that you're going to actually test. So once you have the question, understand the falsifiable hypothesis. Uh, for research design, keep it sophisticatedly simple. Arnold Zellner, he's a Bayesian econometrician, had this paper called you know, the KISS framework, keep it sophisticatedly simple. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, overly complex and crazy, but it, it also shouldn't be like mind-numbingly simple. Uh, there's, a, there's a sweet spot in there, and if you hit the sweet spot, uh, and make sure you test any of these threats to validity and are honest about them, uh, then you can have a measurable impact on the organization when you kind of go the last mile and do this, this communication uh, and making sure uh, people are taking you seriously as a, as a data, science, data scientist because you have uh, credibility. Um, and the, the, I think people get tripped up a little bit in this testing your threats to validity um, because you maybe you know, think, okay, what if I just can't know whether or not this thing that could make the whole house of cards that I've just built fall down uh, is you know, true or false. Um, save that for later. That's your next paper, your next project, right? That's called progress. Uh, and it's kind of how, how science has always worked and, and we should keep that in mind. So just because you, you are like, well, I don't really know about this assumption, doesn't mean you shouldn't do a thing or the, th and the thing that you discovered is not, is not valid. Um, finally, this is just like a random smattering of papers that were on my desk when I, when I wrote this slide. Uh, if there's anything else, like kind of a applied papers uh, and the data, it, at the intersection of causal inference and data science and uh, marketing or product or anything, feel free to send them my way. I, I quite enjoy reading these. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one question. Thank you. <laughs> Whether it's, um, th thanks for the great talk, um, whether it's problems with uh, power or the application of a quasi-experimental method which often changes what you're actually estimating, right? The estimate's different. Um, how do clients respond to that? And what are your strategies to telling them, actually, look, we can't answer what you hired us to do. We're going to answer this other thing instead. So that's a really good question. It's the second time I've been asked that as the first question after giving this. Uh, <laughs> So, you know, basically I think you're asking like, is this a hard sell to clients and like how do you deal with it if it is? Uh, so, you know, just last week we had the executive team from a very, very large uh, financial organization in our office uh, and one of the people who was with the group, you know, said to me, if you could just prove me right, that'd be great. Uh, I have this hypothesis, I just need to know that it's true. Uh, and, and frankly, like it's easy for us to make that decision. We have this kind of embedded in our company values. Like we'd, we'd rather, uh, you know, get fired than not tell the truth, basically. Uh, so we have had difficult conversations with some clients uh, about, you know, whether or not we can do something for them. And in the end, we've, we've had to either walk away or change their minds. Uh, and sometimes we've had, you know, clients where, uh, you know, our stakeholder on the other side would leave the organization in the middle of a project and it endangered the project because the new person is like, wait, what are you doing? No, that sounds difficult. Um, so it, it does lead to a lot of difficult conversations. Um, one piece of advice that I'll have and usually have for the, you know, the people that work you know, for or with me is to try to do two things And when you're, when you're sitting down trying to earn the client's trust. One, use these methods to show them something they already believe, uh, and then use the methods to show them something that they didn't expect. Uh, so then you kind of have their trust, and then it's a matter of moving on from there. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned about having the journal club and in the company, it seems to be an R&D related process. How about, do you have experience having a general club in a more production company? 
Uh, so the question about do we, do we have a journal club and more in our production company? So the papers that we read in journal club are not just social science methodology paper. Like we read the Google Spanner paper, we read the data flow paper. So we're also you know, reading about what's going on in uh, you know, modern distributed databases and uh, you know, modern data engineering, those kind of things. Uh, we just started reading uh, a couple of books about user-centered design. Um, so we have a few different book clubs, not just like the more academic journal club that we have. Um, so we have management book club, we have uh, design book club, so uh, like human computer interaction, user centered design, those kind of things. Uh, generally, if you know it's part of someone's job, they're going to be interested in getting better at it, and you always learn when you sit down and read and then have conversations about it. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Uh, have another. A round of applause for Mr. Seaver. Thank you.